this, bro. For those of you lucky enough to have tuned in this summer, you've been watching previews from Naked Eye Cinema. Standing actress. Foreign actress. <laughs> and we're all in the window, so you can come and watch us do that. Contessa Ballet. The glamorous, the beautiful, the glorious. Contessa Ballet. We've just been uh, talking, chatting, and having morning tea, and uh, talking about the many, many films that you've made. Now, I know that you've worked with so many luminous and trashy directors in your life, and I um, just want to kind of talk about some of them. Um, for instance, 911. Oh, 911. Well, Merry Evening where Mary? New York cop, knew a New York cop, uh -huh. and I think he wanted to uh, get into some pretty hot stuff with her, uh -huh. and she, uh, well, she really wasn't into it, but then she had this idea after mulling it over, and he was still calling her up, and, my, and she said, well, um, Let's have a, let's do it. Let's get together. Uh, Turner vanishing. Very psychedelic. Is this the way, um, is this really evocative of the um, t Turner's uh, painting? Um, or is this more of a... Um, that's a still. The film is about movement and action. Uh huh. And that's what you see in the film. There's no stasis in the film. Uh -huh. And I'm, it starts out, I have no paint on. Uh
Oh, really? Is in it. Huh. And uh, he plays the protagonist's father. Huh. And uh, there are so many people in it. I don't even know where to That's begin. These are just a few names. Kimber Fowler. Uh huh. Uh huh. Kimber and Samoa. And uh, he said, a quiet uh, evening at home with the neighborachis. Uh, with other bands. I caught Cam and some more at Talk, home uh, in the midst of a week. band uh, crisis. He, Nothing he, too he serious, some kind of but just here. some uh, some uh, kind of a problem kind of arranging a drummer, it seems. I'm not yeah. quite sure uh, what it uh, is. You, you but they're trying to take good. care of it, so in the meantime, we'll oh just um, yeah. cruise around the house uh, and see what we can find there. If we had to cancel it, I had to cancel it tonight, at least, you know. Can I speak to him too? So, uh, okay, I called him at home, so I hope. But whoever it was, a girlfriend or something. Yeah. And do what? Yeah. One. I know. I, I'm very um, sorry to hear, um, but um, I guess everybody knows now about Ethel Eichelberger. Right? Yeah, I just okay. came from a memorial to the mama. Okay. It was one of the beautiful things I've seen. Welcome uh -huh. home. Uh-huh. Like you were saying, so huh. it was drag, uh -huh. it was a thing. Uh-huh. I remember What's Ethel, my call? Uh, just his regular act. With the accordion. accordion yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember him from the pyramid when we were dancing and doing shows there. And yeah. So when's the next big show? Loneliness is no virgin to me. If you become naked... Jack Waters and I'm here at Jenny Nails with Kimber Fowler and we're getting manicures. Hi Kim. Hi Jack, how are ya? Okay. Good. So what you doing? Well, um, Jenny Nails just opened up here on 2nd Street near yeah. Avenue A yeah. and I always wanted to get my nails done. Uh, last week I was making a film uh -huh. and uh, a film called War is Menstrual Envy. It's a new project by Nick Zed, starring Annie Sprinkle, myself, Ray, Samoa, and a few other illuminaries. And I had some gold Lee's press on nails on. Wow. You know, and we, we applied them with this uh, crazy glue. Uh -huh. So um, I've been in agony last week. I couldn't wait for this day, for this interview with you, really. My cuticles were throbbing. So, you know, it's such a luxury. I love beauty treatments. I really do. I think we all deserve a few beauty treatments, you know, once in a while. 
I think so. This is my first professional manicure. Now, Kembra has progressed through her life through many ages. The age of entropy, the age of stellar wisdom, and so forth. Starting out as a child, as an Olympic-bound gymnast. You train for the Olympics. That's right. Yeah. Yes, I used to um, tour all up and down the West Coast doing gymnastic shows uh -huh. for ladies' auxiliaries, and I was being trained to go into the Olympics. And um, I broke my arm. I, I snapped my elbow out of, uh, out of gear. Uh -huh. And that ended my gymnastics career. But did you feel that, that, um, that public um, exposure at such an early age kind of set the stage prepare, in preparing you for a, um, for, for a career and, and, uh, on the stage, as it were? Was it a traumatic experience? It was very traumatic, yes. I was in the hospital for months after that accident. and. Um, I really, I really wanted to, to, you know, I would be probably selling tampons on television mm -hmm. right now. And I would be doing, you know, I do my own brand kind of product endorsements today mm -hmm. with Diet Pepsi. Mm -hmm. Diet Pepsi is the company that's representing me right now. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was really obsessed with, uh, with athletics and gymnastics uh -huh. when I was a child, and it was devastating, you know, to be hospitalized and medicated at such a young age. It really changed me. I became a different person. Well, what did you do all that time in the hospital? Um, I think I, I became artistic. Uh -huh. I really did. I um, There was really nothing to do. And I couldn't move. I had my elbow in traction along a T um, on the ceiling, so uh -huh. I couldn't really go anywhere except for the shape of the T. A lot of my paintings that I did in the 70s are the shapes of T's. Uh-huh. Yes, it's a familiar theme in my paintings. Now this is all um, happening in, in um, Southern California where you grew up. Yes, I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. And then later... The film capital of the world. Of course. Which um, I can see where your where you're, um, enthusiasm for the cinema has come. Now, later, um, you went on to, uh, to Germany. You spent a lot of time there. That's right. How was that? How did that affect you artistically? Well, I was really miserable in Germany. Uh-huh. I can't stand Germany. Uh-huh. And I suffered tremendously. <laughs> and, um, you know, I found the German people to be very voyeuristic and I, you know, I, I liked learning about uh, history and it's such an old country, mm -hmm. not like Los Angeles where mm -hmm. everything is new and prefab. I grew up eating McDonald's and Taco Bell, and so to go to Europe was, was I guess it was, uh, it was important for me to do. Mm -hmm. And um, it's especially like uh, Austria, because I really like some... Austrian artists, like I was really inspired by Rudolf Schwarzkogler mm -hmm. and um, the Vienna Actionismus group, mm -hmm. and also a filmmaker named Kurt Koren. Mm -hmm. I really liked all that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So going there and, and, and seeing it firsthand was really exciting. And also uh, a friend of mine, Valerie Karras, uh -huh. an, an important film actress and artist, was living in Munich, Bavaria. So we hung out, hung around together. And she took me to the circus and caused lots of trouble and things like that. Yeah, we're actually um, are also interviewing Valerie on that show because, as, as uh, many people know, Valerie has been a very um, vital element in a lot of our work. So were you actually making film at that point? Yeah. From, uh, I was on a tour in Europe in 1984, and I'd been doing, you know, kind of like live performances with um, my pu husband and partner, Samoa. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was funny, but I've been doing a lot of live performances where I would basically make a big theatrical stage setup and do these little pieces. And um, 
I would always get really angry at the video people and the photographers because they would come and take pictures and, and of my work and they would never give me any pictures and they would never, they were so, you know, they were so reluctant to give me copies of the videotape. So I said, well, gosh, you know, I'm just going to film my own performances and sort of take the steering wheel, as it were. Uh -huh. So when I got back from Europe, I got into film basically because I was so fed up with having all my images pilfered by these. Uh, fading photographers with mm -hmm. uh, absolute, absolutely lacking in any sense of art direction. Uh -huh. So I, I took command of, uh, of my own images and decided to edify them on film. Uh -huh. Luckily, when I got back to New York, uh, some friends of mine were, were um, doing Super 8s and you know, people like Bradley Eros and Al Aline Mayer had access to video. Uh -huh. So uh, I started by going over to uh, Bradley's loft in Brooklyn with all my costumes, and we filmed in video um, the the first uh, few scenes of Coronella's story of a burning bush. Mm -hmm. I have my own way of. Uh, altering my film images, which I call um, elliptical obfuscation, uh -huh. and uh, which is basically a fancy way for for saying that I, I shoot Super 8 off of the television set. Uh -huh. And um, that way I can I can play with the colors and so on. And Cornella is, is a story about, um, I'd say it's like a non-narrative piece. Uh, it's sort of like a, a beauty pageant story. Mm -hmm. It's a story about a different kind of beauty, mm -hmm. starring Samoa mm -hmm. and uh, Chili Rigo and Masa. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really the theme of it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Speaking of Veronica, Speaking Kimber's, of getting, oh. Kimber's getting very oh girl with the peekaboo hair. But with Veronica the... Lake's career was ruined as soon as she cut her hair. Did yeah. you hear that? Yeah, well, too true. many women were emulating her during the did war. Did you see her in, in I, did you see Veronica Lake in I Married a Witch? That was the original Bewitched. Right. Really? Yeah. yeah she, she was in it. Great. She looks like a, a real broom, broom flyer. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just in, in, in everything. So, um, how did you how did you start doing it? Where did you get the idea to uh, to film it? Um, that came from this friend of mine, Joe Walsh, because he and his lover are both HIV positive, mm -hmm. and David, his lover, had to go through this very elaborate ritual of injecting uh, a drug, DHPG or gancyclovir every day in order to uh, combat a certain virus that is commonly affects a lot of people with AIDS called cytomegalovirus. Mm -hmm. And um, Joe suggested that we film it, um, that it might be interesting to film it. So we did. We filmed the, uh, the ritual of him injecting this drug. And um, it, the film turned out very um, powerful, kind of very poignant film. And an important film because of you know at this time mm -hmm. at this time and so mm -hmm. it's shown quite a bit uh, several you know festivals and places all around. Mm -hmm. so. uh, and so as far as your your um, you had an exclusive with them that was the um, just for the, the premiere. So then we can see it now on yeah. the show. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Well, let's see it.
great that part where she was just there. We're like, just I gotta keep on smiling. I mean, you were sitting at the couch and we just looked at each other and both gave both these laughed. huge smiles and laughed. <laughs> somewhat of an activist. Um, as long as I've known you, you've, you've always been politically motivated in one way or the other. Um, and I'm just curious, or I'm not curious, but I'm sure other people are, about your involvement outside of your film work in gay rights, um, you know, especially in light of um, DHPG, um, what you've been doing with your AIDS activism. Uh -huh. um, you know, I, I go to ACT UP and I go to some of their demonstrations and some of the demonstrations. And I stay pretty involved with them. Um, ACT UP's a good, you know, I like the idea of advocacy, I mean, uh, of active activism. I'm not a huge fan of advocacy. Mm -hmm. And because I see it as working within too much within the system. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much it accomplishes when you're in the midst of a health crisis. You know? But you have had some direct involvement, like you've helped with um, a couple of the um, medical groups. Yeah, I worked with the PWA Health Group for a while. What'd you do with them? They're an underground buyers club. They get they get drugs into the country that are not approved. This is um. Which, yeah, which one is this? Cost of Lima, right? Love. This is for Valerie. Valerie's an opera aficionado. So they're an, under <laughs> an underground buyer's club. <laughs> oh, okay. Wait, I have to tell you oh, guys camera. something. Wait, I have to tell you oh, guys camera. something. I think it's fabulous. Avenue C has been quarantined. Why? <laughs> None of us can go out unless we're wearing <laughs> welding masks. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's got uh, double protection. That is so good. Down, I brought. Hi, this is Jack Waters from Naked Eye Cinema, freshly arrived from Hamburg, Germany, back in New York. Home um, again, as you can see in my own kitchen. What's that all over the front of your shirt? Nothing. The camera can't see it. The camera sees everything. The cum stains, cum stains, okay? Cum stains. Since you so knows it. Mr. Kramer. Fuck you. Now, Mr. Kramer, who's so nasty tonight, is going to be interviewed on his film oeuvre. But first, we're going to tell you about the coming attractions on Naked Art Cinema. Forget it. I want the interview to happen now. No, I want the interview now, okay? Then let me go over to the camera. No, Turn don't move the camera. I don't want to be on camera. Oh, you're going to be interviewed off camera. I'm going to be interviewed off camera. Okay. Mr. Kramer, <laughs> tell us about your film over. Well, my over. Tell us well, about your film ovaries. I don't have any ovaries. Tell us about your film ovaries. Tell us about your work, then. That reminds me of a joke. Just to know. I have the jokes I don't need. My name is Death, and I'm here to envelop you into the darkness. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah, I think you stole it from Louis Cherno. <laughs> Tell us about your film work a little, Peter. Oh, my film work is so fabulous. It's so extensive. Mm -hmm. I've been working...
my first uh, foray into Super 8 films uh, began with um, my hands-on experience of documenting a uh, demonstration at the Federal Plaza down in Lower Manhattan. And it um, was a demonstration uh, condemning the U.S. violence in uh, Central America and uh, to uh, demonstrate the support for the end of intervention uh, of U.S. forces in Central America. That was back in 1986. Uh, Federal Plaza happens to be the site of the courthouses of the um, state of New York and also the federal courthouse as well as the International Court of Trade plus the CIA, the FBI. And um, during that period there was also the sculpture of Richard Serra, Tilted Art. And that uh, sculpture was of course a focal point of very many um, outrages and um, discussions and public hearings. Uh, it was initiated through the Public um, Art Fund. I'm not sure actually if the Public Art Fund had anything to do with it uh, in particular, but it was a yes. public art project and initiated by the, uh, I think probably through the NEA and the uh, yeah, right. So the GSO or the GOA, the General Accounting Agency of um, the U.S. government. Right. And um, there were very uh, many protests by the workers in the uh, building because they felt that it blocked the views, et cetera, et cetera. And um, just that general um, feeling of protest and uh, civil disruption was sort of the catalyst for that film. Followed corrective measures with what? Coney Island. Coney Island was next. And that was a, a walking tour of the historical amusement park. As Michael Carter described it, kiwi birds I view of Coney Island Amusement Park of America. In relation with Coney Island? Uh, Coney Island is fascinating because it's this undercurrent of violence and decrepitude and um, basic uh, decay with the desire to escape reality by going on his amusement park rides and uh, I had some pot. 
I have to find the pot. Pot uh, is a thing of the past, my son. Is it? It's so expensive. Is it? Yeah. Well, we're such these villagers. Here we are. It's five o'clock. We're having our morning coffee. All right. Cigarettes. Coffee, cigarettes. Talking about pot. <laughs> None in sight. Right. Do you want sugar? No, You're telling me about the um, the um, compilation that you just made. Oh yeah. Um, well. It's, you know, the end of the era. It's 1991. The war just started five days ago. And uh, I was looking at all my articles that I've done over the years. And, you know, I'm writing for newspapers since 1979. So I picked out 75 articles that summed up sort of what I've been looking at for the last decade. Different political movements I've been involved in, what issues I've been looking at. Mm -hmm. So it starts out Carter's president, and you go through everything. The first article starts out saying, four months from now, our lives might be completely changed if Reagan is elected president. And in 1980, I did this series where I went into Right to Life, and I got, you know, dressed up as a Right to Life, or went to Right to Life conventions, and I wrote a whole series of exposés on them. Mm -hmm. So that's in there. And talk about the abortion movement, the new right, the religious right, the uh, porn debate, which kind of was the end of the feminist movement, basically. The beginning of AIDS. I worked for the New York Native. I covered the um, bathhouse closings for the Native. It was the city hall reporter. Mm -hmm. It's like all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating because the gay leadership at that time was really, really assimilationist mm -hmm. and totally unprepared to deal with anything like that. Mm -hmm. And they're so. When I go back and look at the interviews, they're so mealy mouthed. They had no idea how to respond, and they just let everything, you know, slip out of their hands. They had no control at all. What's this? What are they? What are they? They're, they're having trouble dealing with the witch, with the porn. The bathhouses were with the bath. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I covered that. Then the founding of ACTA. Uh huh. You know, I did a whole bunch of articles on various AIDS-related issues and, um, you know, homelessness. Uh, women being excluded from experimental drug trials, pediatric AIDS, the whole spectrum of issues. And then it ends with, you know, my critiques of the NEA debate and how the art world formulated their opinion, which I had a lot of problems with. So it just really goes from the election of Reagan up to the NEA. It covers that whole 10 years. I just put it together into a manuscript, so I'm hoping it'll be a book. Huh. So how how did you how did you put it together just from just like pulling all of this stuff from hard copy? I pulled it and I had to edit it. Uh huh. You know, I mean, I started I was 21, mm -hmm. so some of the writing was a little embarrassing, but I fixed a few things. Uh huh. How do you connect it? Do you connect it or it's totally linear? You're just watching everything happen. Uh -huh. right? You know, Reagan's elected, the right rises, abortions, you know, being taken away. All these things are happening. The women's movement starts falling apart. But everything just follows. Uh huh. It's it's really it's a wonderful little scenario structure uh -huh. actually of the demise of our values. Yeah. So you don't insert editorial comments in between pieces. That's nice. Yeah. Huh. The um, the um, film festival. You do the. Um, you you're one of the curators of the Dan Lesbian Experimental Film Festival. Yes, my and husband Jim Hunter. <laughs> husband in art. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, um, how did you start it? Um, Jim came over to my house for dinner, and we were just talking about. I guess this was, okay, this is our fifth year, so it's, we had our first discussions in 85. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about how, um, I guess that was like the AIDS crisis was fully underway at that time, uh -huh. and how nothing that was adequate about how any of us were living was being expressed in mainstream cinema. And at the same time, experimental film was so marginalized, and it was only being shown in these really obscure art houses. Nobody ever saw it. The main, the, um, straight art world was not supporting gay experimental film. The gay film festivals were not supporting experimental film. So this work that was really wonderful was completely disappearing. And so we decided to create a context for it to be shown. 
we decided we're going to do one festival. And we started looking around for films, and we ended up with like 60 films. There was so much out there, mm -hmm. you know, that we we had more films than we could possibly show. Mm -hmm. And so since then, every year we've done a full week of programming. We've shown, you know, somewhere between 50 and 65 films a year. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really been wonderful. Mm -hmm. you know. So what's the overriding aesthetic of the film festival you know, in terms of... Um... It has to be something that would be meaningful to a gay audience and that is in some way formally inventive. Mm -hmm. Those are the criteria. Mm -hmm. Mm. It doesn't have to be a gay filmmaker, mm -hmm. but it has to be resonant to a gay viewer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. For example, um, in, particularly in the area of AIDS, I think that the experimental films have been far more effective and emotionally honest mm -hmm. than the mainstream films. I mean, if you take a film like Carl George's film, DHPG One More, mm -hmm. where it's very, very simply made, it's shot in Super 8, it's got sound on cassette, it's the most simple kind of cheap filmmaking that you can do. But he shows you two real people, you know, in their real daily life and how they're dealing with one man having to inject, you know, Gancyclovir into his body and how he and his lover have accommodated their lives to that procedure. Mm. If you compare that to something like Longtime Companion, the Longtime Companion ends up looking so banal and benign and unreal compared to this just like little film that Carl made, which is so wonderful. Or um, Jim's film, Elegy in the Streets, is a 40 minute silent film mm -hmm. about AIDS activism and it's cut in with footage of his old lover, Roger Jacoby, who died at AIDS. And the film is hand processed. So not only is there the emo obvious emotional issues in the film, but because Jim can control the surface texture and color and um, emulsion, the, you know, the relationship between the co um, contrast of the actual film, there's a whole superficial layer of emotion that it creeps into the viewer's experience that's not there with that um, you know, technicolor look that you get in from a Hollywood film. Mm -hmm. Because the film is silent, it can't be shown on television or it won't be shown in a lot of festivals because people think that audiences can't sit through a silent film. Mm -hmm. But this film is so 
powerful because it's silent. But you have to watch people's faces. You have to watch their body language. You know, you're not swayed by hearing chanting like you would in a standard documentary. It's just really, really wonderful. And that kind of stuff you can't see it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. With someone you love and get comfortable and watch these previews we have for the upcoming Naked Eye Cinema Show! rendition of Blade Runner. Is this still the interview? <laughs> yes, we're the interview. Yeah. Yeah, you look good like that. 